Hey, this is Matt Whitmer from Birdie Precision. In this video, we are going to start a new series on a huge and critically important topic, cybersecurity. Uh, we could do a thousand videos about this topic and we will have just scratched the surface, but we're going to get started here with just a small little one on why you should be uh, cognizant of cybersecurity and why you should be thinking about it in all of your jobs and all of the work that you do um, here going forward. Uh, so let's jump in real fast here and uh, take a look. All right, so we're going to jump in right away with the answer to the question why you should care. Um, more and more of our devices that we're installing out on our sites out on our jobs are connected. Uh, we've got valves that have IP connections now. Uh, and more devices that we install, we make our attack surface larger um, and we make it easier for our devices to pop up on the internet if we don't configure things the right way. And uh, with the advent of AI and crawlers and spiders and you name it, uh, it's easier than ever to find those devices on the internet. Uh, if you haven't already, places like Shodan exist where you can try, type in Niagara and uh, find all of the Niagara devices that are exposed out on the internet, no matter where they are and what country they're in. Um, and there's more incentives than ever for bad actors to take advantage of those devices being out on the internet and exposed um, maybe without those people knowing. Um, and those incentives, obviously, most of the time are money-related. Things like ransomware are becoming more and more uh, of an issue. Um, things have died down slightly lately on the ransomware front from what I've seen, but it's still something to concern yourself with because uh, you don't want to lose all of your data and all of your um, trust with your customer, potentially. So one of the important key factors when you're uh, installing these IP devices and you're thinking about cybersecurity is thinking about what your risk tolerance is. Depending on the job and your end user, you might not even have the ability to decide the risk tolerance. They may tell you what their risk tolerance is and you might not have a choice but to follow their recommendations and their requirements on that site. That might seem like a bad thing, but in my opinion, it's a good thing. Uh, IT departments that are willing to work with you and have strict requirements that um, you need to work around or work with them on um, is always a good thing. Having more people involved with this process always makes things easier um, in the long run. Short term, maybe it might be more difficult for you to get it up and running. Um, so um, the risk tolerance always comes as a trade-off of a few things. So if you have a lower risk tolerance, uh, that means that your security requirements are going to be higher, which also means that your convenience in accessing your site or working with your site is also going to be lower. Uh, security and convenience have like a uh, uh, relationship with each other where uh, the lower the convenience is, you're probably going to have higher security and vice versa. And then if you have a uh, high risk tolerance, that means that you can have, you can get away with uh, lower security requirements and it's a little bit easier for you to do the work that you need to do. But you should be considering all of these um, factors as you are working on things. Who your end user is, where these things are being installed. Um, and this is a subjective and an objective thing. You may just decide, even though this is like a single JACE that's being installed with a cellular connection, um, you may decide, I want. I don't even want to chance things. I want super high security, and uh, I'll take those uh, downsides that come along with that. So there's no right answer here, but just something to keep in mind as you're thinking about cybersecurity generally. So as an example, say I have a JACE that I'm installing um, along with some controllers into a building. They're all IP-based, they're all networked, and I want to ro remotely be able to access them to program and monitor those devices from uh, my office and not have to send a truck out and go out to the site. So if my risk tolerance is high, that means I can have uh, a little bit less security when it comes to uh, accessing that site, but it's a little bit more convenient for me. So that a typical example of that would be something like a port forward. Um, it's 
relatively easy to set up if you know what you're doing in the router that you're using. Um, it's a couple clicks, a couple numbers that you enter, and you're off and running. And it's easy to use. You just punch in that IP address, the port's forwarded for you, and it looks as if you're punching in the IP address on a local network. But your device is totally exposed out on the internet, or your device is, potentially, are totally exposed out on the internet without any real protection. Now, you may say, but if somebody doesn't know my IP address, they can't get in. Um, obscurity in 2025 isn't really a uh, protection or it isn't security like maybe it was back in the day. Um, it's really easy to find that device out on the Internet. And um, you can see this uh, exemplified by people who put like honeypots and things out on the Internet, which is basically a computer that you intentionally open up ports on and people will find that device because the ports are open and they will get in um, because the ports are open and they're intentionally trying to get people in, hence the name Honeypot. But digression aside, um, obscurity isn't security. Don't assume because it's only an IP address and uh, it's difficult to find on the internet that someone won't find it. They will and uh, you may be in for a bad time if they do and they figure out your security or you have a vulnerability in whatever version of software that you're using on the device that's being exposed. And then on the other side, if you say, uh, okay, I want that remote access, but actually I want, uh, I have a lower risk tolerance and um, I'm going to put in higher security uh, VPN in this case, your convenience level is now going to go down a little bit. Um, you may be required to do two-factor authentication. Um, you may be required to have a client software package installed on the device that you're connecting from. Um, and it may be a little bit more difficult to set up, but the internet can't see your devices. Um, and depending on the VPN that you're using, they may not even be able to see the path that the VPN uses into your network. They may not even know that there's anything at that uh, IP address on the uh, wider internet. And, of course, because of that, they can't see what services are, you're running. They can't see the headers in those uh, servers' responses that say maybe version numbers and that kind of thing. So remote access wise the recommendation for reason is always a VPN so how do you go about securing yourself this is um, a few items that we'll probably talk about in more depth in future videos um, in this series so things like Niagara have very good secure defaults and uh, options and dashboards available to you that will help you uh, see what your uh, potential risks are, where your uh, vulnerabilities are, uh, where uh, bad actors can get in and potentially uh, do some bad things to you. Um, but a lot of devices nowadays are using uh, what are called secure defaults. So basically, out of the box, they're coming set in a very secure manner so that you don't need to go in there and manually make those changes yourself keep these things don't change them because you want to have a little bit more convenience uh, those security faults are there for a reason and you should use them second item is keep your software updated uh, again if you're using Niagara make sure you have an active SMA so that you can get your uh, latest versions of the software and you can get your patches as you need to with any software there will always be vulnerabilities there will always be bugs but the thing that you want to try to do is stay ahead of those things and the vulnerabilities um, so that you always have the latest software installed to protect yourself. As I mentioned before on the remote access side, make sure you're using a VPN. We'll talk about these things in more depth here in the future. And then lock down your IP networks. Uh, if you're installing switches and that kind of thing, people often... Um, forget about physical security. Uh, cybersecurity isn't just out on the internet. It's also uh, you want to protect against random people from plugging into your network switch maybe that you install on a panel. Um, so, you know, lock the panel uh, as well as lock down the ports on that switch. Again, we'll talk about that in more detail here in the future. And if you really want to dig into the weeds, I highly recommend you check out the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. Uh, that's from much more smarter people than me who um, basically their job is figuring out the best ways to go about uh, thinking about your cybersecurity and securing yourself from a business perspective as well as from a perspective of uh, your jobs and the kinds of things that you're installing out in the world. 
So hopefully that was uh, not overwhelming, and uh, hopefully you stick around and check out future videos in this series. We're going to have a whole bunch more. I think this is a super important topic, and there's a lot to talk about in it. So uh, if you want to hear about anything in particular, you can leave it down in the comments below. Like and subscribe if you haven't already to see those future videos that we put out. And as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Thanks.